tonight, a star-studded panel discussion and preview of the new movie, Paul, Apostle of Christ, taped live before an audience at Franciscan University. Star Jim Caviezel, executive producer Eric Groth, and biblical scholar Scott Hahn join me on a very special edition of The World Over, right now. Now, from Washington, D.C., Raymond Arroyo. A warm welcome to all of you joining us in the United States and the world over. Our exclusive preview of Paul, Apostle of Christ, with Jim Caviezel, Scott Hahn, and Eric Groth, with unseen footage, is coming up. If you'd like to comment on tonight's show, you can send me a tweet at Raymond Arroyo. But first, an important story to bring you. It appears that there's a lot of activity at the Vatican this week to burnish the image of Pope Francis on the occasion of his fifth anniversary. The Vatican Communications Office was caught in an embarrassing, clumsy attempt to lend heft to Pope Francis's theological prowess this week. They told the Associated Press on Wednesday that they had doctored a photo of this letter by Pope Benedict XVI. Officials smudged out some of the latter lines of the letter and suppressed the entire second page. Monday, the Vatican used it to suggest that Benedict had endorsed 11 books of theology, reflecting Pope Francis's thought. They quoted Benedict as saying that he and Francis enjoyed internal continuity. This line was used to beat back those critical of some of Francis's ideas, particularly concerns about Amoris Laetitia. On Thursday, the Vatican admitted to the AP that they had doctored the image of Benedict's letter and left out the bit where the Pope Emeritus says he did not have time to read the 11 books of theology, does not endorse books he hasn't read, and won't be endorsing anything. According to the Associated Press, the missing content significantly altered the meaning of the quotes the Vatican chose to highlight. The Vatican Press Office has not commented on why the picture of the letter was doctored. The AP pointed out that just weeks ago, the Pope had condemned fake news and the distortion of facts. And the major blunder comes on the heels of an announcement that the Vatican has produced a new documentary by Wim Wenders. He's an Academy Award-nominated filmmaker. It's titled Francis, A Man of His Word, and it features Francis speaking out on immigration, ecology, social justice, and more. It will hit theaters in May, but it's not the only film coming to your cineplexes. On March 23rd, Palm Sunday weekend, this movie will hit theaters. It's called Paul, Apostle of Christ. We'll preview it tonight. It stars British actor James Faulkner as St. Paul and Jim Caviezel as St. Luke. The story centers on Paul's captivity under Roman Emperor Nero's persecution of Christians and the special friendship he and St. Luke enjoy. I moderated a panel discussion about the film recently at Franciscan University with Jim Caviezel, executive producer Eric Groth, and Franciscan University's own Dr. Scott Hahn. You can see it in theaters next week, but tonight, here's our exclusive look. It was taped before a live audience at Steubenville Watch. I want to jump right in. You know why we're here. We're here to talk about this incredible new movie, Paul, which uh, is coming this Palm Sunday everywhere. I know many of you are joining us live via streaming video, and we have your questions we want to get to, but I want to start. I'm going to ask the panel. I'll work my way down. Why this story of St. Paul, and why now? Jim, you were offered, I know after the Passion, to play apostles, saints, a few villains, Jesus again. Why this role. Why Luke, and why did it take you so long to come back to a biblical epic? That's a long question. <laughs> Just Ant, one at a time. Um, you know, uh, uh, I had uh, was looking at, you know, when I looked at The Passion, it was a great script. Uh, Mel Gibson had come off the uh, Braveheart, and um, you know, he's quite a remarkable uh, director, and, uh, and so I, I, don't, I didn't know how to turn that one down. Um, this one, a great script, um, and a lot of them, uh, it didn't, this, this one was amazing because it didn't beat you over the head. A lot of the uh, dialogue that was used 
by Andrew Hyatt was cleverly put in there. Uh, I knew, you know, when I when the film was about uh, done, there was a guy that I brought in to watch it, and he didn't, he doesn't um, know God or any religion at all. I just wanted to hear what he he would say, and he he said that that was a great film, and uh, he says, but the writers it. You know, he's a genius. And I said, why do you say that? He said, well, he's like a philosopher. I said, well, what, what were the lines? Well, to live is Christ, to die is gain. That's a, that's a very interesting concept. And I said, well, that's in the Bible. Oh, it is. Oh. <laughs> so uh, a couple days later, he calls me up, and he, he says, you know, I'm, I might want to see your passion of the Christ. And I said, uh, oh, okay, here, I'll, I'll go get you a copy. Hey, well, hold on a second. I said, I might want to see the Passion of the Christ, but at least it planted a seed, and, and it had the effect that we were looking for. Yeah. Uh, Eric, why St. Paul and this moment of his life? You know, St. Paul, th this could have been an Indiana Jones movie. I mean, the guy's shipwrecked. He's beaten. He's arrested. He's beaten. He's clubbed. He's arrested. I mean, there's it, it, a lot of drama that happens with St. Paul. Why this part the latter part of the life when he's imprisoned. It's kind of confined uh, sainthood at the end. Why did you all choose that part of the story? Yeah, I know it, when you try to decide how do you tell Paul's story, you really would need to make a multi, multi-episode mini-series almost out of it. You know, so how do we, how, where do we land? And it's, it, was, it was an exciting thing. It's an exciting thing for us to kind of reflect on someone's life, especially these amazing saints of the past. From the, from the end of their life. And you, and you look at, you know, the amazing conversion experience that he went through um, from being Saul, the greatest persecutor of the early church, to the Lord saying, you're mine. This is me who you're persecuting. And turning, you know, his heart converted into the greatest promulgator of the faith. And, and, and yet to look at that from the end of his life where he's, he's gone through that conversion and all of those experiences where he's gained wisdom, and, and yet we can still see a man who's very human, who knows he's saved by the grace of God, and yet he still has those struggles with his humanity. And that's, I think, an important thing for us to re be able to reflect on and say, hey, he's a lot like I am. Yeah. Dr. Hahn, before I go to a clip, because I realize you all haven't seen this movie yet. We're not going to show it to you tonight. We're going to show you a trailer, but hold on. Uh, Dr. Hahn, the importance of St. Paul today and his relevance today would be what? For the last 2,000 years, no other writer has had the influence of St. Paul. When you look at the New Testament, he wrote 13 out of the 27 books. He was Luke's mentor. Luke was Paul's companion. For this movie to show the two of them sharing one heart, one life, it's significant. Luke only wrote, wrote two books of the New Testament. Uh, the Gospel of Luke, which is the single longest book of the New Testament, and in second place is the book of Acts. And so he only wrote two, but he actually ends up giving us more words per word count than Paul, the two of them together over half of the New Testament. For 2,000 years, people have been pouring over this, but for the last 10 years, especially Catholics, because 10 years ago this year, Pope Benedict XVI called for the year of St. Paul. And so we spent a whole year focusing on his writing, sort of rediscovering his, his genius, but also his art. Yeah. Well, we're going to show you a clip of this, a little glimpse of Paul, Apostle of Christ. Watch. I, Luke, send a message to all those that follow our Lord Jesus Christ. There is a terrible evil in the world. Darkness is spreading. <laughs> suffering persecution faith is being tested I know you question the way but I've come to Rome to find Paul to write his story to bring hope to bring light into this present darkness and to remind us all how God changed a hateful man who will change the history of the world Luke am I dreaming I'm here Stain with the blood of our brothers and sisters. No! This is what trusting God gets you. People are desperate. We're the only light left in this city. I cannot fix their faith. You can inspire their faith. You risked people looking to me before Christ. The day I heard you preach, my God, I saw Christ in you. There are men, women, children that will never meet you. 
There must be a handwritten account of your acts. What do you really know about these Christians? I am concerned with these documents. We've got to get these out of Rome. Do you think that we are plotting an escape? Write another word and I send you to whatever god you want. Look! They've got a man to overthrow Rome. To what end? Justice! They want revenge. No! Why not? Love is the only way. When the moment comes, you will have the strength to do what is right. Your people died today. This world doesn't know a thing about love. Where sin abounds, grace abounds more. Now, as I watch that, Jim, um, there are those who have seen it, and I've seen it. There is one moment in prison, and I don't think we have a clip of it, but I'll tell you, where you are sharing with the people in prison about to be handed over to Nero's circus and thrown to the lions. You teach them the Our Father in that scene. Was there any hesitation going back to this biblical era and did you worry about this performance being compared to that of Jesus? I didn't. I didn't. Uh, I didn't mind it, um, because um, I wanted the world to see Jesus in Luke. Aren't we at our greatest when the world sees Jesus in each one of us? So. That's a bonus. <laughs> a little twofer, a casting twofer. How do you like that? Um, did, did playing Jesus, and someone, one of the questions that came in, and I, we're taking your questions and we'll be asking them a little later. Did playing Jesus help you in any way or prepare you for playing this character, whom we don't know a whole lot about, and we'll talk to Dr. Hahn about what we know of him. There's not a lot of biographical material in the Gospels about Luke. Well, Jesus was a lot harder because um, I had to walk on my pool twice a day and right. get that down. Uh, <laughs> that one was a lot physically just more demanding. The, the uh, uh, you know, the whips, the, the beatings, the um, shoulder separation, pneumonia. Um, Makeup times were from 2 in the morning till 10 in the morning. From 10.30 to 4.30, I was usually freezing. And then um, they had to, you know, get the makeup off. And that took two hours every day just to get it off. And then I, I had, you know, sores all over my body. And then I ended up having pneumonia. I ended up struck by lightning. And it was uh, <clears throat> open heart surgery, you know. So, but you would have never seen that performance had we shot that in a studio. It was birthed in pain. The pain in this movie, uh, Paul, the Apostle of Christ, was just the neglect that, um, that God feels in as, as how I felt when I was going to Mass every day, that the world doesn't love him. And um, when you do something like this, you go to a very, very deep place and it, he, doesn't, uh, he doesn't protect his friends from suffering. Um, so I remember James and John, when they said, I wanna be at your right and left hand side. And are you willing to drink the cup I'm going to drink? Yes, and you will. So. Whenever you do uh, something like this, if you take the cross out of it, if you take any kind of suffering out of it, um, it's not going to have the power that needs, especially in this day. Yeah. Yeah. 
the, the, Dr. Hahn, tell us about Luke himself. What do we know of him through either the sacred tradition or what clues do the Bible, does the Bible give us as to who he might have been? Well, there's a certain irony here because we know most of what we know about Paul from Luke in the book of Acts. And we know most of what we know about Luke from Paul. Uh, in, in terms of written sources, he refers to him as the beloved physician. We surmise that he was most likely a Gentile. But he was also Paul's companion from chapter 16 in the book of Acts all the way through. But he more, more than just a companion, more than just a protege, he was a disciple of Paul. When you read the Gospel of Luke, you realize how a Gentile could have assimilated so much of the Hebrew Scriptures to illuminate how Christ fulfills it. But this is also where the oral tradition of our church kicks in. Because how did Luke know what he writes in Luke 2.19 and verse 51? She pondered these things in her heart. Well, the tradition sort of fills in the blank by telling us that not only did he spend time with the Blessed Virgin, but he also painted her. That was another element that he had this gift of artistry. And so this icon of Our Lady goes back to Luke and our tradition. So Luke has a depth and at the same time a humility about himself. And so he spends most of the time in the second of Acts giving us almost most of what, well, most of what we know about St. Paul and his travels. Scott, I wish you were with me when we made this movie. I would have been a lot better in it. <laughs> that makes two of us. <laughs> I wish I was. The sequel. You can come back and advise on the sequel. Okay, I have to share this with you. This is a little clip of Paul, Apostle of Christ. Watch. Evil can only be overcome with good. Well, considering all they've been through, can you really fault their response, Paul? What did you tell them? Love is the only way. And after all you've seen, you still don't believe it. isn't anything I've seen. My God. This is a world in the grip of evil. This, this, this is Nero Circus. It's, it's, it's passionate hate. Blood washing down in the street. Widows, orphans starving to death. Babies born with the slightest defect or disposed, dispatched, discarded. This world doesn't know a thing about love. So you would give up on the world when Christ did not give up on us? Why not? No. Why not? Love is the only way. Love that suffers long. Love that is kind, that does not envy, that is not proud. Love that does not dishonor, that does not seek for itself. Love that is not easily angered. Love that rejoices in truth. Love that never delights in evil. Love that protects, trusts, hopes, endures all things. That kind of love. Give me your hand. Do you understand? I write it down. It's a great scene, um, and it kind of captures that relationship. Eric, why, and tell us your thinking on this relationship between Paul and Luke. I mean, we see it there in Stark, really. Absolutely. It's, 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 it's so beautiful to watch, like, these actors bring it to life, too. You know, like, I mean, how many times have we heard that 
the love is patient, love is kind at weddings and everywhere, when you see the context that it may have come out in, you know, or something real human, their relationship um, is beautiful. It's, 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 it's a big brother, or younger brother. It's a mentor to someone new and growing in the faith. And, and um, it's just, it's a beautiful thing to show. And I, I think in our world today, you know, as filmmakers, we want to put in, in, in the context of these stories, um, all kinds of things that we can connect with, you know, and we have a need for mentors in our lives, and we have, we have people that we look up to, and we have people that have drawn us deeper and, and into our faith, and that's just so important for us to, to see and share in the film process. Jim, for you, first of all, we should say, and both you and Eric can talk about this, this was a very tight shoot. Um, uh, James Faulkner, who plays Paul, only landed on the set three days before you started shooting. So this, you didn't have a lot of time to build a relationship with James. Raymond, that, that scene uh, wasn't originally written in the script. Um, I asked Andrew if he would write this scene, and he did a marvelous job at it, but it wasn't in the original. Um, I said, because of this is one of the most familiar things I, I always hear at weddings. Mm -hmm. Did you draw on anything personal as you approached this world, Jim? I mean, you'd gone through, you lost a mentor, a couple of them, this yep. year? Well, you knew Beverly Dean and uh, my manager and uh, my lawyer uh, died this year. Um, he happened to come with me. I, I, I did a thing for Pope John Paul in Poland and uh, he came with me to Auschwitz and uh, we went in, to the very place that Maximilian Kolbe um, was executed um, and you just could feel the hauntingness of the souls. Um, and so when I came back, I said goodbye to him and he, uh, didn't know that I was never going to see him again. He, um, uh, died in the hospital two weeks later. And, um, so uh, David Zeon who produced this came back to me again. He'd come to me originally for it and talked to me about it and I didn't jump up and down about it. I think it was just the appetite wasn't there. And then uh, I, two of my staff, um, husband and wife, um, committed suicide. Um, and uh, I, it's so one of the worst things ever, you know. And then I get this screenplay and read it, and it just, I had to do it. I just had to work this out. And I think that, you know, how to, that was part of um, life happens. And well, you were ready for it. Yeah, when it you, came, you were well, This movie essentially is what happens when your mentor goes. You know, you're there, and Frank and I, would, we would walk along. Uh, it wasn't easy doing The Passion. It, wasn't, it was much harder afterwards because of the, just the response of what, you know, a priest um, has a collar on, and I can res have a lot of compassion for them when they're treated terribly in, in a, sh a shopping store. Or, um, but... My, my collar's my face. And you would, people walk by it and say, there goes Jesus. And there's Jesus. But a lot of times it's not good. But you know what? That, I, I'm not a victim here. And that's what Frank always talked to me about as a mentor. So um, in this particular scene, it's, there's no victims here. And Paul definitely wasn't. And, but I had to find ways to make him a bit of one, you see. He can't play a guy who's good becomes gooder ends the goodest, uh, pardon my grammar. <laughs> and I think that's a problem with a lot of faith-based films. They're just so full of sugar. I can't drink that much Glad sugar in my sugar. coffee. Didn't know where you were going there. Okay. Yeah. Um, let Scott to set up this next clip. Give us a sense of the historical and biblical context of this moment in Paul's story. Because uh, in the wider context, we're seeing a Christian community under assault, in hiding, being persecuted. Paul is imprisoned. What else do we need to know to fully understand this? The Roman Empire under Nero fell into the deepest corruption. The darkness was most likely demonic. And so here is the Christian community as the body of Christ experiencing what Jesus' body had just undergone a couple of decades before, back in the early 30s. And so 
you recognize that this is the moment when it looks as though this empire, this culture of death, will snuff out the life of Christ's body. And yet, the relationship between Paul and Luke, and I love the way James Faulkner plays Paul because I'm not sure people love Paul, but they will after this movie. And I've loved Paul since I was 15. He has been a person of interest of, of mine for 45 years. You know? But I think what this movie shows us, it reminds me of that old proverb, they buried us, but they didn't know we were seeds. And you see that, and you really do see that in this film. You know, these people, they think it's the end. I mean, they really do think this is it. Right. And it's only the beginning. I want to show you this little clip. This is another moment uh, from Paul. Watch. We must retaliate for this brutal act. Many of us have only a short time left in this city. We must hold strong now. Hold strong? So we're like diseased dogs then? We do nothing to defend ourselves. While well, we're chased from the city just to be hunted down and killed. Yes, yes. We understand your anger. Tarquin was like a son to us. We should never have let him go. Why do you blame yourselves and not the ones who have murdered him? And who else have they taken from you? This woman has come to you covered in the blood of her child. And what would you do, Cassius? Tell me, what would you do? We do what they do to us. Murder them in the cover of darkness. Set fire and burn them in their homes while they sleep. You speak as if your ears have never heard the words of Christ. You never worked with Christ. How can you say he would say these things in the face of such an evil like Nero? Quiet! Be still. None of us here have walked with Christ. But Paul has followed him longer than us all. I have watched him be beaten. I have watched him be stoned and flogged. And never once did he raise his finger against his oppressors. Let peace be with you. For we live in the world, but we do not wage war as the world does. Peace begins with you, Cassius. That was the only way. You really see that tension we were talking about. I mean, they, you know, should we take up arms or should we just keep suffering and love our way through this? We have a number of questions that have come in from many of you watching. Uh, you're watching us on Forum, on their uh, internet outlet platform. So I'm going to get to some of those questions and then we're going to take a few questions from here as well. Uh, this one came in for you, Jim. Uh, I, this woman, or man rather, Mark Smith. I was saved during the Passion of the Christ in 20, 2004. I've been in ministry ever since and the movie changed my life. Do you expect this film to have the same effect as the Passion? A lot of questions about the Passion. I'll give you that one and one more. Do you think this film will have the same effect as the Passion? Um... Answer wisely. I yeah. <laughs> I think it will have a great effect, a tremendous effect on people. It has a great power in it because we didn't, um, you know, the performances are powerful, but the words are still stronger. And we didn't change any of that. Um, I, I don't, <clears throat> the Passion of the Christ was a, a unique experience that has never been if, before. Uh, I was, 33 years old with the initials of JC and it was just, I mean, it was, it was Jesus. Um, and it, that was a miracle in itself because I kept saying, why would you choose me? And if my friend from Magigoria said, God doesn't always choose the best, Jim, but he chose you, so what are you gonna do about it? <laughs> but it's true, you know? And in this one, you know, the, the, uh, the, there's a great message in there about forgiveness. That, mm -hmm. And this was very powerful in this time right now because people are talking in my industry, civil war. This is crazy. 
You have no idea, you know, what you're talking about. 600 and something thousand people died in the Civil War in our country in the last one. Can you imagine what, that, what you're talking about? This is not what our Lord wants. Forgiveness is everything. It's forgiveness at all costs. And that does not mean it weakness. It does not mean passivity. It means meeting evil face to face with love. And that's the power behind this one. I have questions for you two guys too, but I have, to, I have a follow up here and I've got tons of these. I was going to ask you this earlier. Jim mentioned, and I was there for some of this, the shoulder, shoulder separation during the Passion of the Christ, hypothermia, uh, uh, the, the body, you know, when they would take the latex body suit that he wore on the cross, when you'd peel that off, the first layer of his skin came off on some mornings. Um, given all of that and the hits with the whip, all of that, the physical suffering, this questionnaire is asking, was it worth it to go through that physical suffering and would you be willing to do it again? I did it one time. That's all I need to do it. <laughs> Uh, no. But there's talk of res the resurrection, the sequel now. Yes. And would you do it again? Well, that's the resurrection. <laughs> <laughs> but I can tell you this much. When they roll the stone away, there won't be little Easter bunnies and eggs <laughs> around. <laughs> it, it, this is, you know, this is the real deal. And what he's going to do with it is going to blow your mind. It's absolutely going to make you so proud. Scott, um, we had a question, and they were asking, how true is the depiction in the film to the scriptures? You've seen the movie. I have seen the movie. What I would comment on is the relationship between Paul and Luke. Mm -hmm. I would underscore how similar it is to the relationship we can, can, we can see between Paul and Timothy, Paul and Titus, both of whom he speaks of as his spiritual sons. That's what you get, that spiritual bond between Paul and Luke. So when they look at each other, you get that sense of spiritual paternity. You know, but the fact that Paul wrote so much of the New Testament, he is the most studied writer in history. But we don't recognize to what extent all of us are spiritual children of St. Paul. And I think that's one of the things that you really pick up on, not just a love for Paul, but a love for Paul's spiritual fatherhood that has affected all of us. You know, he says, imitate me as I imitate Christ. The only thing that he really did that Christ didn't do was write. Jesus never wrote anything down. He said, do this in memory of me. He didn't say, write this. And so most of the 12 never ended up contributing a single book to the collection of 27 that we now call the New Testament, but not because they were lazy or disobedient. They all did this Eucharist in memory of him. But Paul is the one who really took his rabbinic training and applied it with the Holy Spirit to illuminate the mystery of Christ fulfilling all of the promises and all of the prophecies. And I would say this movie really captures that relationship which I want to strive after. And this movie is dedicated to the, the persecuted church, those who are persecuted for their faith. Was that an idea from the beginning, Eric, or something you all... No, it was actually a, you know, an idea that came in prayer, like later on as we were, you know, multiple drafts into the film and, and our lead producer, T.J. Burden, and I, we were walking and just kind of really, again, l reflecting on what was going on around the world. And also, and reflecting back to the time when we did most of the writing of this film was really when, when things with ISIS and the terrorism was really heating up and starting to get pretty intense and, and more aware. So kind of connecting it to that and just realizing that this is... You know, this is going on in the world right now, and so many people suffer. And we in our American culture, we don't get it. We don't, we don't understand it. We don't feel it. And yet, there are, we've got to find ways to reach out in solidarity. And even a simple way of saying, hey, we're, th we're with you. We walk with you. We love you. We know you're being persecuted, and, and, and to offer them that. Scott, Scott, these letters of St. Paul are really about a persecuted people to a persecuted people. It re these really are letters of uh, keep the faith, hold it together. I know it's bad. I know they're burning you in the streets. I know they're cutting you up, but this is the, embrace it. Keep walking through. What of that message do we need today, and why is it so relevant? When you look at the earlier letters of Paul, like 1 Thessalonians, or even the Corinthian correspondence, there's a lot of 
interesting and profound theological speculation. But when you fast forward to the prison epistles, you get a sense that they're shorter and they get right to the point, which is how do you live the gospel, especially in the face of the persecution around us in the world. And I think, you know, I, I think back 30, 40 years, nobody saw this coming. I mean, what has happened to our culture in redefining everything from marriage to right and wrong. You know, it, traditional morality is now viewed as weird, which is the weirdest thing of all. And so we have got to buckle up and really pray and enter into the wisdom of Paul's writings because we might not end up in prison, but our children or our grandchildren will, and they're going to have a lot to learn from the lessons of this man. You know, it's said that Paul was such a zealous apostle. Paul was. Because Saul was such a zealous persecutor. God redirected all of that energy. And even though he's aging in this movie, it is really refined and deepened. And I think that's the kind of wisdom we need now. You know, theological speculation has a place. But that really practical wisdom in the face of death and suffering, this is where we learn life's deepest lessons. Jim, we had some um, Twitters, tweets, tweets <laughs> from, uh, I know what they're called, I'm just, it's late. Uh, we had some tweets. Uh, a Susan Brown writes, hello from Scotland. Will the movie get a release in the United Kingdom? Eric, you answer that one and then we'll move on. There's a part two to this. Well, with James Faulkner being, you know, a great British gentleman, he'd better get a release in the United Kingdom, yeah. right? Yeah. <laughs> no, it will. Um, and it's really exciting. Uh, along with our March 23rd release here in the United States, we currently have it being released um, end of March to the middle of April right now in 24 different countries around the world. Yeah. Tell, tell us about the spiritual practices that you adopted as you were preparing and working on the film. The, the spiritual practices you adapted for the playing of this role. Well, uh, in the, the Passion of the Christ, I, I went to, I took the Eucharist every day. And it, it's powerful. I mean, it just, it goes right through my DNA. It, it attaches to it. Um, um, on the Passion, I, you know, I, I would go to confession every day. And then what, what I would do is, as I was uh, praying the rosary, then I would go into that, into the Aramaic, the Hebrew, the Latin. And that kept my focus very, very strong. Um, and then in this one, you know, I got up early in the morning, and you went to Mass as well. Um, Malta has Catholic churches all over the place, so I just walk out my door, go right inside there, and then I, I had the uh, relics. I had Luke. Um, St. Luke with me, I had uh, St. Paul with me, and, uh, and then just um, always prayed the rosary. Um, and then just the rest of it is just, um, oh, and I have a devotion to St. Genesius. And uh, of course, Our Lady really, you know, she brings so much peace because constantly we were, we're when you do films like this, you're always going to be under attack. But I don't see, the difference is I don't see that as a bad thing. It just sharpens me. It, it, it makes me stronger. I b believe that the devil is more afraid of me than I am of him. Jim, I want to ask a quick question. You, will, you can all take a crack at this. Um, Eric, what do you there's a moment in the movie where Paul tells okay. Luke, sure. we had miserable days together, how I miss them. And I love that. That so captures their not only their relationship, but what they went through. And that, that explains the closeness of this bond. What did that moment mean to you? How did you prepare and show this uh, father-son relationship with a man you barely knew? He was, you knew him for three days as an actor. You know, that was one of those scenes that was done when we were in Malta. Again, another late scene as, as time goes goes on again the, the, these guys were very flexible and continually wow. uh, breaking making this uh, 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 you know something that had just humanness to it you know there's humor in this um, and uh, I think that you know it, Paul uh, Luke here is a, he's a he's a pagan he's a doctor he's got his life made in the shade mm -hmm. you know um, I don't know how many times the guys in Hollywood say, why are you making all a ruckus here? You've got a great life, Jim. 
you know, you, you, you're making money, you're do, doing that, and it was just this emptiness that I'm supposed to do something more. Um, there are good doctors, and there are bad doctors. What is a good doctor? A good doctor goes out, and he administers to his sick, even in the middle of the night. My dad would get up and go help someone else out because he understood their pain, and he wanted to help the, rid of it. And he'd do it at any, any hour. That's a very good doctor. Bad doctor is essentially someone that does it for money. And you can play it that safe uh, in, my, in my business. And I thought of, uh, about that with um, Luke, that he had it made in the shade. And yet when he heard Paul speak, his life was changed forever. He never, he, in fact, he says, I never saw Christ in the flesh, but the moment I heard you preach, I saw Christ in you. We need to be Christ for others, and that's through our love. You know, we also wanted to provide a moment where you think about the struggles that we all have in our journey of faith, and, and some of them were at the times we're in the deepest, darkest pits of our lives, and yet because of what Christ has done, we can even still find joy in the midst of that. You know, and we can find, and that joy can, and that joy really does come from the fact that we know people are walking with us in a lot of ways. We have companions. So even in the midst of their trial and the turbulation and the struggles and the journey they went on, you know, you've, and you're also kind of, you're, you're together in a mission and you're rooted in something that God has called you that you're doing together. And it could be a hard moment, but it's, it's different where it, it, we may not always experience that happiness of life. But even in those trying times, we can still find yeah. joy. And we wanted to show that in the film, to bring a little levity. There's a moment where that can happen. Yeah, they wanted, he just, I was thinking about uh, my growing up experience as a young person. And I was dating this lady, and I, I prayed God would give her to me, and he did. And, and I remember going, God, please get this woman out of my life. But I'll tell you that when How I... does this relate to Paul? Well, you'll find out in a second. Oh, okay. <laughs> I, wa I wasn't... She wasn't home. You know, she wasn't home. Uh, it's like your Rome sweet home. Uh, I wasn't home. Um, and I, you know, at first, um, that was very important in there because why would you give up all the, the things? Um, it's because it... That, uh, here is everything. When I finally met Carrie, I was home. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, it's, it's been the best. I almost never did the Passion of Christ. I almost never uh, was an actor. Uh, I almost um, never married my wife. Um, and I almost never adopted my three children from China that had brain tumors and cancer. Um, what a boring life. You know, and I think that was the spirit of that scene. It's like, you know, here we are with the Romans, you know, we're kind of uh, something pretty cool here probably is happening. It's hard, but it, it's still beautiful. There, there, there is also something, that mentorship, and I, I, the more I, I was weeping during that moment when he said, you know, what miserable days we had. God, I miss them. I, I, I was thinking of my friend, Father Richard John Newhouse, whom you knew, Scott, um, for those of you who didn't know Father Richard, he was this kind of magisterial figure. He founded First Things Magazine. He had this great rumbling voice, sort of like Paul. Yeah. And when he was dying, the last time I saw him, we took him from the hospital, and we were driving, and I said, well, we've got to, you know, the Pope is coming, and you're gonna, we're going to do this next thing. And he took me by the hand, and he said, oh, no, my friends, our adventures are over. <laughs> our adventures are over now, Raymond, but you'll have many more. And when I... When I saw that moment, I kept thinking of Richard and so many of us having to let go of the people who we relied on for all these years. And that's a hard thing because you now realize you have a bigger role than you thought or that you, than you, you bargained. You have to be that role model for others now. It's the passing of the guard. Yep. You want to add anything, Scott? Yeah, I'm, I'm reminded of that old TV series, uh, Band of Brothers. Yeah. You know... When, you, when you're working with people you wouldn't even be friends with, 
but you've got to be willing to lay down your life for them and they are for you, suddenly you end up bonded in a way that you couldn't even imagine before that experience. And if that's true in the natural realm of human conflict, how much truer is it in the supernatural realm of spiritual warfare, where Paul and Luke are more than just a band of brothers with Titus and Timothy. You know, they've seen false brethren. They've seen people defect to the enemy. They've felt the pressure to even consider that, but they've never caved to that. So to say goodbye to Paul must have been one of the hardest lessons for Luke. And yet at the same time, to end up being able to spend time with Our Lady, you know, that is offsetting consolation, if ever there was. <laughs> say, yeah. Yes, sir. Uh, this is for Jim and Eric. How pervasive is the anti-conservative, anti-Christian attitude in California and Hollywood? And how uh, is it ever vicious in terms of its manifestation uh, or uh, hurtful? We're, I'm pretty new to the scene in a lot of ways, you know, so I might defer to Jim because he's had so much experience with that. Uh, yeah, sure, it's hurtful, but... Um, you know, it goes back to uh, being a victim. You know, uh, what are you going to do about it? Um, make great movies, you know. <laughs> and really, that, that's, that's what it, I, I, that was, you know, there's my mission and there's God's. Which one are you going to follow? You know, I, I didn't, I, I, there were five things I almost didn't do that would have changed my life drastically. And being a Christian is taking the hard road but it's the greatest road. It's adventure, it's fun, it's... I will, I will say, um, as, as film producers too, that it, it, the mission is more than just the film that we make, but the mission is also the caring for and the loving of the people in the process of making the film. And that's, that's the thing that tugs my heart the most, that God has, is using the, the tool of the film but, and, and we, we hope that it blesses millions and millions of people. But the few hundred people that we got to work with in the process, you know, were we loving them? Were we expressing dignity? Were we caring for them? Were we being servants? Were we, and you know, you, you can look at Hollywood and you can be overwhelmed by the craziness uh, of it. But, but if we can just say, hey, we, we, we need to do our part, what God's calling us to do, and to love those people who are in front of us and care for them, then um, I think that's how we can kind of it's, you know, little by little make a dent. And in this film, I won't reveal it, but the, the moral conundrum at the center of the film is really about serving those that hate you. That's right. That's what the whole movie's about. Do you smack them or do you serve them? That's a hard question. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Kind of along of the same lines as the last question, uh, I am a senior theater major, and I cannot tell you how many times I've been told, you're either going to have to give up your faith or you'll never make it. Um, what advice or consolation would you give to the theater majors that are trying? I'd say hog, hogwash. <laughs> uh, hogwash. I'm right, I'm right here. Don't, you know, I'm, I'm right here. You know, there's the, the same thing. You know, I, I heard it a long, long time. But, you know, Count of Monte Cristo... Uh, you know, passion of the Christ. Trust me on this. All you got to do, there's, <clears throat> my dad played basketball for John Wooden at UCLA. Great philosopher. He had a thing called the pyramid of success. The pyramid of success that I go from is your mental capabilities, your physical capabilities, but what drives you is the Holy Spirit, the fire that gets in your heart. You could do anything that, that, that read the scripture, you know, uh, of all the miracles that occur. I'm, I'm here. I'm a walking miracle. I got struck by lightning. I mean, they split me in half. But here I am. I put myself back together somehow. With my Jesus powers, I did. <laughs> yes, sir. It seems like Christianity is presented in one of two ways in Hollywood, and one of the spectrum, there's the cynical secularism, but on the other end of the spectrum, it seems like there's this sort of soft prosperity gospel version where, you know, the coach, all he has to do to go state is believe in Jesus, and, you know, the villains are the mustache-twirling atheists. <laughs> so, you know, breaking the mold and, you know, get, getting into Hollywood, how do we keep 
Christ's message authentic and real and not have it get watered down into soft uh, pandering. Christ is, Christ is authentic. Be authentic. That, 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 is, that, that is the truth and it's the power. When you come in a room, I've seen every athlete that really believes. I've, I've seen people that give lip service. But what is authentic? Love. They feel your love when you walk in. They, they, they know you're credible. They, they don't have peace and they're craving for it. And what I, I just don't believe in passing the buck off to someone else, that I have to do it. And that's my relationship with Christ. And I go through the mother because she really authenticates it. I'm being obedient to what the son asked us to do. I'll, I'll, I'll say it like this, like, for example, when I go to Starbucks, this is a kind of a Jesus Psalm, Jim Caviezel, JC, you know. Um, but when I go to Starbucks, I love pumpkin scones. Every year I love the pumpkin scone. <laughs> my man. But I also like my coffee very hot and black. Okay? Now, when you drink black hot coffee, right, it's bitter and, it, it's, and you got to, you know, pull that air and cool air to cool that down. I enjoy that. I don't know why, but I enjoy that process. <laughs> After I drink a bit of bitter, I then temper it with some sweet, okay? If I have too much sweet, I temper it with some bitter, okay? The way that Christians, a lot of them tell bad movies, and not just them, other people that, uh, they put all the sugar in their bitterness. And one, then I'm, I'm tempering, if I have a sweet roll and I bite into it, now I'm going to temper it with sweet coffee. There's just too much. It's across the board. You, you, they, can't be, um, they can't be mixed, but you can mix it in your mouth. And, and that's just the fine art of doing that. Mel Gibson, if, that analogy goes with Mel Gibson and how he does a film and how he sets you up. But he's always continually staying ahead of you. And you have to guess where the guy is going. And that's just what I was born to do. Uh, but... Uh, yeah, does that make any sense? Well, well that's the nice <laughs> thing about, it does, and that's the nice thing about this film. It's one of the few Christian films, if I may use that nomenclature, since the, really the first since the Passion, that acknowledges the brutality that's happening around these people and what happens to them. And it's not always a pretty picture. But to my mind, if you're not going to be honest enough and show the whole thing, then don't tell the story. Yeah. That's half the story. I mean, we had people all the time, you know, coming after us and saying, oh, you know, I just, I just don't like violence. I just don't like violence, you know. And, and they miss the spirit of what Jesus has done for us. Um, I can't look away from it. Uh, when we uh, did that, you know, Mel was like, okay, all right, we're going to put the hooks in Jim's side right here. Jim, come here. Right, get over here, all right? So when the... When he runs over here and he comes over, bam. I, oh, sorry, Jim, did I hit you? Oh, yeah. And then put the hook right here and it's going to rip the flesh right off his side. And everybody's looking at him like, what? Oh, don't worry about it. I'll figure it out. You know? And then he cuts away and he shows the Blessed Mother. It's just extraordinary. Um, he tempers it, but you think you're seeing it still because you see her flinching. And we still see it in in our mind's eye, we think we're actually watching it. But what was more disturbing was showing the, the devil holding the baby. Now, what do you think that means? I mean, so, you know, you have the Antichrist, you have Satan, and then his genius is like, here we are, you know, carrying the cross, and then he goes, oh, I got an idea. Jim, come here, walk down this way. <laughs> okay, now, put the devil over there. And put Mary over here. And, and Mary, you look at the devil. Just, just look at him. And Jesus, you don't look at him. Okay. So you just keep walking down. And so they're both looking at each other. But Mary, it's brilliant. I mean, she's just like, not with my children. Not with my children. It's, it's so powerful. And then later on, you know, he's like, all right, Jim, I know your shoulder's really messed up. And beep, beep, beep. You know, and... and uh, <laughs> But you're, but you're carrying it, okay, and you're going to go down, all right? And then the, I'm going to have John, and you know what? No, let's not do that. Mary, you go run, run. And so she's running, and he speeds the camera, and this is just the genius of the man. And she comes, and 
lands there. I mean, just like at home plate. She runs, no, I want you to slide in like you're just like, it's a World Series game. And you know, she's from Romania. <laughs> and, and what? Oh, yeah. So he run, you know, and ran. So she just ran in and slid right into me. And at, right at that moment, then the cross comes down, and boom, because uh, my shoulder was dislocated. I turn out, uh, look up, and I got my own blood because I bit my tongue so bad that it, it just, um, the streams of blood coming out my mouth, and Mel's going, wow, that's brilliant. I love it. <laughs> and the whole say, you have her say, um, son, I am here. Aluemi, me. Chuda ha-chadesh. Mother, I make all things new. And then I lift up the cross. My shoulder's dislocated, and I got to get my arm over the darn thing. And because it's dislocated, it looks like I'm holding the most precious baby that ever was. You know, that that cross was so, and it was just, that, that was the act of God that was, it w was doing that. So, you know, going to Mass every day, these little miracles would happen. But how it makes, what's great about it is that when suffering comes, I don't run from it. The cross, I go to it. I attack it. I go into it. I, I, I want if this loneliness, then so be it. I'm not, my, my faith isn't conditional on how I, you know, whether I'm loved or not. I know I am. Scott, before we go, is there something there for us to understand about the enduring power of the scriptures in that it unflinchingly captures the real history and the real moment that these people that we are called to follow in their footsteps lived it doesn't look away during those horrible moments. It bears down. No, it doesn't. And when I reflect back on my watching of the movie, I was struck at first by, wait a minute, that's from Philippians, that's from uh, Corinthians, uh. that's from, you know, and I, he wrote that about 10 years earlier. You know, he wrote that about 15 years earlier. But I've written a fair bit, and most of what I've written I have spoken both before and afterwards. So what this film impressed upon me was, how much of what we read in Paul was in the heart of Paul all the time, not just when he finished one epistle, he never talked about charity and love, you know, again. No, this was exactly what he talked about all the time. And so he's not quoting his epistles, he's reading straight from the script of his heart. That's, that's what it's all about, the lived, the lived experience, whether on screen or in our lives. Gentlemen, I thank you all for your candor, your honesty, your fun, and for all of you for allowing us in. It's been a wonderful evening. I want to thank everyone at Franciscan University of Steubenville, particularly Michael Hernan, for being such gracious hosts. Paul, Apostle of Christ, opens in theaters everywhere March 23rd. That is all the time we have for now. Until next week, the show continues on Twitter and Facebook. You can like me at both places or follow me on Facebook. The links are at RaymondArroyo.com. Be sure to join us next week. We have an exclusive one-on-one -on -one interview with Jim Caviezel, a very moving interview. And authors Missy and Mia Robertson will be here from the Duck Dynasty clan. They'll tell us about their new book, Princess in Camo. It's a children's series. Until then, we'll be scouting the world over for all that is seen and unseen. On behalf of the staff and crew of EWTN News, thank you for watching. I'm Raymond Arroyo from Washington, D.C. Bye now. Thank you.